I've been reading the word and just loving it in a new way. Listen, God spoke about this Pentecost on Mount Zion several times in the Old Testament. He says in Isaiah 2.2 that there's going to be a time when we're all the mountain of the Lord. Mount Zion is going to be lifted up above all the other mountains and we're going to say, a whole bunch of us are going to say, let's go up to Mount Zion. Why is Mount Zion important? Because Mount Zion, Jerusalem, the city of the great king, is where God glorified his son through the outpost pouring of the Holy Spirit. How do I know that? Glad you asked. On, now, when I get like this, I am not mad. I'm glad. I lived my whole life waiting for the Bible to light up like this. In, in, the, in the great feast of tabernacles, tabernacles is in the fall, Passover, Pentecost, in the summer. He's saying, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But... John says this, but this he spoke of the Spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. It was going to come, for the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. I was told that Pentecost was the birth of the church. Yes, it is. But no, there's more. There would never have been a birth of the church if the Father had not glorified the Son and poured out the Holy Spirit. When Jesus went to death, hell, and the grave and took those keys to death, hell, and the grave and went to, and you know, really, when he, remember when he came out of the tomb and Mary Magdalene tried, tried to engage him? Well, that, well, the Bible says touch. But the translation means to hold on. Listen, Jesus didn't want to be held on in that state. He was not yet finished. He went to heaven. And I know, and you may choose not to believe this, but my thought is when he went up to heaven and presented his blood as the perfect redemptive sacrifice that all of heaven went nuts. The Father, and you say, well, how can you say that? Because he was asking to be glorified. He was glorified when he took his blood and put it on the mercy seat in heaven. But did the earth know he was glorified? No. Until. God through, you know, <laughs> they're having this visit. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about the term glorified, and I have ex explained or I've given definition to this. When God glorified his son, he called all of heaven to acknowledge the dignity and worth of his son and to manifest and acknowledge that before all of and all the dim, all the dimensions yeah. he said this is my son and i honor him i glorify him I adorn him with luster. I clothe him with splendor. I want to tell you the father and the son are in love with each other. And when he said glorify me as we had in the beginning, he was talking about the kind of glory that is an expression of true holy love. And so that's when Jesus said, when Jesus said, what I do, what can you imagine the shock because I could only find it once in the Old Testament, Sandy. That, that the Jews knew that God had a son. 
And when he talks about the son, he doesn't even say God's son. He says, a son will be given. Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah was a prophet and he looked ahead and he saw that which would, would come. He saw the glory that would come on Mount Zion. He knew that Mount Sinai was not the ultimate destination of the glory of God. Mount Sinai was the giving of the law. The law does not produce glory. So he looked ahead and he saw, he saw Mount, he saw Mount Zion. He saw the city of the great king. And he said, not only are one of these days are we going up there, but the king himself is going to establish it. That's what he says. And then Joel says, he's going to pour out his spirit on all flesh. You know, God, God's got a plan. God's got a plan. And then, and then in Psalm 87, 5, this is what God says about Zion. And of Zion, it shall be said, this and that man was born in her. That always troubled me. I thought I was born again by the Holy Spirit. Guess where we see the great initiation of the Spirit? We see it on Mount Zion. We are born into the manifestation of the glorified Son by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, my words are spirit and life. And the highest himself shall establish her. You and I are involved in a mystery between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And it is not logical, and it is not linear, and it is filled with passion. Can you just imagine when Jesus and the Father are having this discussion about what Pentecost is going to look like? Do you think Jesus went, came back and didn't know? Excuse me while I get excited. Do you think he didn't know what Pentecost was going to look like? He and the Father knew. He said, now, you're going to go back and you're going to get everybody ready. Because you've been talking to them about being my son and receiving my glory. That they can be where you and I are in the glory. In that glory, in that limitless glory, in that eternal, everlasting part of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So he goes down and he talks to him. He spends 40 days with him. Now, what do you think he is talking to them about? What are we going to have to eat? Who's going to do the fish fry? I suspect he's talking to them about the mysteries of Isaiah 2. The mysteries about Joel, about the mysteries right. about Psalm 87, the mystery about I've got the I've got the keys to death, hell, and the grave. I'm, I've set you free from the law of sin and death, and you are under, born into the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus. Romans 8:22. Do you think he told them that? How do you think? How do you think John wrote? 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Revelations. He had some inside information. Yeah. Jesus was very busy on those 40 days. Yeah. He's, and that's why they obeyed him. I don't want, I don't want to go. What are we going to do? What, are we going to just pray all the time? No, no, no. They had some inside information. And 10 days they were together. And then on the 10th day, when that day had fully come, whose day? Whose day? God's day. God's day. This is all about God and Jesus. There would have been no church without the glorification of Jesus. And the Bible says that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is evidenced that the Father glorified the Son. Yes. Yeah. 
That's it. Now, let's go one step more, and then we're, I think we're, I think we're good. Let's let's just go to Acts. It is not good for you to know times or epochs which the Father has fixed by his own authority. You know, the, they were always wanting to know what time it was. They were never satisfied to live in the present reality. They always wanted to know what's happening next. Do you think if he told them what was fixing to happen next, what would have happened? They would have had a better plan. But he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and in Judea in Samaria and even to the remotest part of the earth what do you think the witness was the witness was not only that Jesus was the son of God the witness was not only that through the forgiveness of sins and redemption, you can go to heaven. The witness was that it is no longer I that lives, but Christ that lives in me. You cannot say that kind of outrageous stuff unless Holy Spirit has baptized you, empowered you, and clothed you because otherwise it sounds ridiculous. It's outrageous. Well, I'm telling you what. It was so outrageous that it made them all drunk. Now, push that point in an evangelical background, and I'll bet you'll get some pushback. What a party. Nine o'clock in the morning party. Everybody is so shocked, so thrilled, so personally affected and empowered to witness that they were not in their old human mind. They weren't in the frame of their old mind. That would have bothered you. You would have said, are they drunk? As you what? As you judge. See yeah. law. I just want, excuse me, this is going to happen one of these days. It's happened once before, and it could happen again. That's what I'm looking for. it. So much of Holy Spirit comes and empowers us that we forget who we think we are, and we might get drunk. Well, I just don't believe that. It's very dignified. Well, I just want to tell you why God's trying to kill the dignity in the church in America. I, the, the plan in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit was revealed in Colossians 1 and 19 that all the fullness of the deity, all the fullness of God would dwell in Jesus. That in him, Colossians 2.9, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. In him, you have been complete. Colossians 1.25 said, it's a mystery. Hidden. Now manifested. Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of glory. Whose glory? The hope of God's glory. The hope that God would get some glory out of this new creation that he has made you to be. That, that he could honor you. That he could recognize you and I. That, that we would carry the dignity and worth that his resurrection, power, bought for you and I. There's so much more to be a witness to 
than the salvation message that is not it's another gospel it's another gospel if we're not understanding that the gift of Pentecost was the glorification of the Son so that the Son could fire up his church with his presence with himself with his glory, with his honor to be housed in us. Jesus wants us to have that glory so that we can glorify the Father. The Father is delighted to glorify the Son because the glory, the Son didn't need the glory. Who needed the glory? The church needed the glory. The church needed to have the absolute official glorification of the Father. The church in America is ready for a suddenly. The church in America is ready for this revelation that it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. That because I am born again, because I've received forgiveness of sins, because I've been redeemed, that I no longer belonged to the human race fathered by Adam. I belong to the human race fathered by the Son of God. The reason why light cannot fellowship with dark is because when you're really lit up, you, you're, not, you're not even spending a lot of time in the same mental capacity than, than. We don't have fellowship with dark because we don't have any dark. God wants to celebrate his church. That's what glorify means. He gave the Holy Spirit so that we could glorify the Father and the Son and so that the Father could glorify his Son in us. He wants to praise us. He wants to honor us. He wants to adorn us with luster. He wants to clothe us with splendor. He wants to make us renowned. He wants to render us illustrious. He wants to give us the dignity and worth that his son's body and blood purchased for us. When we remember Christ in the communion, we're remembering him as the one who is glorified and sitting at the right hand of the Father. We remember him as the one who is glorified and the head of the church. We are remembering him as the one who made it possible for you and I to come out of death into life and immortality. Every time we swallow communion, it's more than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's more than anything that we have experienced or seen Jesus experience in this earthly dimension. He is the firstborn among many brethren, and he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And because he is seated there, we are much more than we ever thought we were. He will glorify me, Jesus says, that the Father will glorify me, for he will take of mine and will disclose it to you. Everything that the Lord Jesus Christ went to hell for, he did so that you and I can be where he is, that you and I can experience the fullness of the gospel. Gospel is good news. I, don't, I think that most of the people in America don't really know the gospel of the good news. We know the gospel of do-right. You ever heard of Dudley do-right? Well, that's what's put on us. Guess what that, you know where that came from? 
That came from Mount Sinai. That comes from the law. Do right, be right, and you'll be right. No, the moment you were born again, the moment you received the Lord Jesus Christ, the moment you acknowledged his seed on the inside of you, you know, Paul did. He said, when it was time for the Father to reveal his Son in me, have you had the Son revealed on the inside of you? Listen, here's what the Son looks like on the inside of me. He looks crazy. He looks excited. He looks happy. <laughs> yeah. He looks peculiar. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm just, I'm just about done. All right. No, I'm not done. <laughs> Just to remind you, John 17, 22, this glory that was poured out on Pentecost that separates you and I from the history of the law. We can appreciate the law, but that is not our history. Our history is the grace given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ from Mount Zion. Mm-hmm. He didn't pour his Holy Spirit out on Mount Sinai. Mm -hmm. He poured it out on Mount Zion. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them. Now that's outrageous. Mm -hmm. That's outrageous. Mm -hmm. And I, there are several prayers in the New Testament where Paul prays for us that we could possibly believe that. I'll just conclude with this. This is what happened on Pentecost. This was the revelation by Holy Spirit that was given from that moment forward. It had not been given before, Sandy. The disciples knew of it. Because Jesus had taught them. But when the Holy Spirit was poured out, everybody that never knew Jesus knew this. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. And that is the summing up of all things in Christ. There isn't anything else but Christ. There isn't a Christ hey, but. Hey. There isn't a Christ in addition to. There isn't a Christ plus anything. The fullness of the times that is summing up of all things in Christ, in Jesus Christ, in his son whom he loved. Mm -hmm. For God so loved the world that he gave the son that he loved. Yeah. So that that love relationship could propel him to the will of God. Things in heavens and things on earth so we could obtain an inheritance. And what is our inheritance? Our inheritance is the Son of God living his life through us as us, empowered by the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. It's not just Bible. It's not just Bible. Because for 1,500 years, they had the Word. But it is not until there is the glorification of the Son that releases Holy Spirit in our lives that we actually participate in the resurrected, glorified life that has been intended. And that's our witness, Sandy. You are a Kanos. And Kanos people freak religious people out. Okay. Kanos people are delighted to find out who they're becoming. They're delighted to find out what the word really has to say about their future. They are happy. It's the happy gospel. <laughs> so we're going to pray now because some of you might want to get born again. 
I'll do it. Some of you might, some of you might want to enter in to the new creation. So, Father, we lift our hearts to you. Whatever measure today that we are lacking, we, because we are trusting in that covenant meal with mm. you, your body and your blood, that we are causing ourselves to identify with everything that you have for us. We pray that now that whatever is lacking, whatever is missing, whatever mystery is hidden, we ask now that you would uncover and cause us, God, to be the true witness of the true glorious gospel and the kingdom of God. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Amen.